All right, and it sounds like the mic is working. Um, so thank you for indulging me in my career-long obsession with finding a way to uh, uh, demonstrate the measurability of the impact of design. So this is my love story. It's with design and the bottom line. So I like to make a few confessions before I ever talk to anybody. So the first is that I'm a recovered architect, a building architect, uh, and I'm also a digital agency veteran. I spent almost 10 years there before going in-house, first at AOL with some of these fine fellows over here, and then now I'm at LearnVest. Um, and then the other thing I think just to know about my personality is that I'm almost painfully pragmatic. I'm a fixer. If I see a problem, I want to find a solution. Uh, and I think that really colors the way that I look at work. Uh, so a little bit about why I even ended up at this place called LearnVest, which some of you may know and, and probably many of you don't. Um, the state of America's wallet deeply frightens me. Uh, so my first scary stat, I've got a few, sorry about that, is that 76% of people live paycheck to paycheck in America. And that includes 30% of people who make six figures. This is absolutely frightening to me. But what's worse is that half of Americans have less than $10,000 saved for retirement. Uh, and another 50% of people in this country are not prepared for an unexpected expense of as little as $400. So this is a lot of the reason why LearnVest is here. It's because America needs help. So what is LearnVest? LearnVest is redefining the American approach to personal finance. Our planners leverage our own financial technology to create simple, affordable, realistic plans for anybody who wants to feel confident about their money and optimistic about the future. Now, you may or may not, if you know about us, uh, know that we're owned by Northwestern Mutual. And I think that the reason why we are such a, a wonderful marriage is that at the core of both of our experiences is uh, a recognition of the importance of financial planning and a mission to bring financial planning to the masses. Uh, on the, on the LearnVest side, we also have digital tools to help people stay on plan. And then on the Northwestern Mutual side, we have financial products that actually help people achieve their financial goals. All right, so back to my obsession. <laughs> now that you know sort of what I'm doing in my day-to-day -day life. Um, I went and saw John Maida a few years ago uh, at an innovation uh, conference, and he talked about this sort of process of evolving role of design in companies, right? So it used to be, if you're old enough, that you do remember that uh, in the beginning, you know, people would conceive of products and, and experiences, and then they would build them, and then at the end, they would have designers come in, and they would tell them to, like, pretty it up. Right? And I think everybody here who's, um, I'm assuming you're at least 50-50 designers and geeks, or maybe some or both, um, know that this doesn't work because there's a whole bunch of things that designers think about that your engineers or maybe your product people, if they were even here, don't think about. Uh, and mostly that centers around the user. So then people went to the other end of the spectrum where they're like, all right, we'll get design up front and we're going to do this great waterfall thing and then get the designers out of the way because they're expensive and we're not sure we really need them anyway. And that really didn't work because all this stuff happens when you implement the thing and uh, it still ends up pretty broken. So the solution in recent times has been to have design there from beginning to the end. Um, all three of these slides I stole from John Maida. Um, and I, it got me thinking, like, is that really enough? Is a seat at the table enough to make something be great design-wise but also be great for the business? Um, we know that design is really important. We finally are in an era where it's recognized that being a champion of design impacts the bottom line. This is a study from Harvard Business Review from 2014 that I love that I'm going to use ad nauseum. Um, and it says that over 10 years, they tracked a, a number of companies, I believe it was 15 companies, who they um, identified as being design-centric. And they found that they outperformed the S&P by 228%. And that is massive. If any of you have been reading lately or heard the Planet Money podcast about what Warren Buffett thinks of uh, what you should do with like your 401k money, he said, just put it into index funds. But these companies that invested in design did even better than the indices. So it got me thinking, like, why, right? Because to have a design-centric organization, you have to get designers in, and you have to keep them in and engaged and working on things in a meaningful way. So first thing, I looked at what their criteria was. And so, you know, they wanted publicly traded companies. They wanted um, design to be integrated across the entire enterprise. They wanted evidence that there was increasing investments and influence on the part of designers, that there was design executives at the helm directing other designers. 
um, and that there is a tangible senior leadership level commitment for design. So all of these, I think, are great measures, but it didn't really add up to me of what it meant to be a design-led organization. So then I began to think, how do I actually de define what being design-driven really is? Uh, so in typical fashion, I decided to do a little study. So I interviewed 12 designers and decided to ask them because I couldn't totally figure it out for myself. Um, I talked to 12 people. There was an even split of men and women. They were in three different cities. I had five UX, five visual, and then a couple other smatterings um, for strategy and a general manager. And I found that all of their comments clustered around the ideas of team structure, the process, and then defining outcomes for any given project or product. Um, Really, the first thing that people said was that it was really important to have somebody high up in design to advocate for the practice amongst business leaders, tech leaders, product leaders, et cetera. Uh, so um, in thinking about my organization, I was like, all right, check, I guess that's me, good. Um, and then there was the process. So I think, you know, we started Waterfall, and then, you know, we've been in this, like, scrum world, which has a lot of good things, and it's trendy. Um, I think it has a lot of uh, use for designers in the sense that it is iterative and you can go back and revise things, but really people are looking for that iterative process, but the thing that maybe the agile practices leave out is really putting the why before the how, and a lot of people did talk about that. So when I think about what the process is that gets designers in, gets them excited about owning a product and working on it, it's this sort of cyclical thing of figuring out what you want to do first, so not just diving in and, and going for the tactical solution to a problem, making something, launching it, and then measuring, evolving, and iterating, depending on what you find out. And then finally, people talked about outcomes. Now this is where it got interesting, because about 50% of these designers that I interviewed, who I adore and have worked with throughout my career, said that um, they felt like serving the business and serving the user were mutually exclusive. And the other ones felt like there could be some harmony there. Um, for me, because I'm a fixer and I'm a pragmatist, I really don't agree with them about the outcome. I think that uh, the, the practice always has to be about merging business goals with user goals, given a, a set of data that you have to get yourself to make good decisions, and then that's where the real magic of design happens and where magic can really impact the bottom line of a business and move it. So um, in my world, this is where like Kermit the Frog comes in and is singing, uh, it's probably magic. Okay, so then, I'm sure a lot of you are in organizations that are in different points of evolving to becoming uh, design-led or even design-driven. So I began to think about how do you actually impact your organization to pay more attention to design. So I think the first thing for people is to make sure everybody around you actually knows the difference between a user experience designer versus a visual designer, or what is the trade-off if you get a hybrid or a full-stack designer? What's a creative technologist? Um, and then to start making the case, or find somebody to make the case for you, do you want big design impact, or do you want small design impact? Um, I can't imagine a situation where people are like, I just want a very small impact on my bottom line. Um, but the thing that people don't always recognize is that big design impact usually means pretty big investment, and so it has to be a real commitment. And then finally, I think one of the biggest misses of organizations that I've gone into and looked at is that they're not necessarily matching the chemistry of the designer with the chemistry of their organization. So you can get a lot of really amazing designers who uh, have no desire to like educate people in design 101, and they're probably not going to be the best fit for an organization that's just starting their journey on becoming design-centric uh, versus um, somebody who really actually enjoys it and bringing people along and sort of... Uh, likes that part of uh, showing people who don't know design what design can actually do. Um, and then finally, for the people that are doing the hiring, to always make sure that they're prepared that designers ask a lot of questions. Um, and part of it is that they are challenging you, and part of it is just that they really want to know. And so it's, it's a collaborative journey and an iterative journey and not to get freaked out. All right, so... The questions that I always ask my team to ask themselves, I give this to our product people, I give this to our business people to ask my team, are what I think of as the five key questions. You guys know. Um, so the first one is, what's the fucking point? And it's the most important question, because why, is, why are you even doing this thing that you've been asked to do? Uh, 
And if you can't answer that, you really shouldn't be starting anything at all. And if it doesn't, the next question is sort of an add-on to that. Does it support the vision? Does it support where the company wants to go or the product wants to go? Because if it's not getting you steps closer to whatever that vision is, in a you know, reality of limited time and limited budgets, you shouldn't be doing it. You should be finding another way to get you closer to where you actually want to be. And if you say yes, and you're looking at design, you need to evaluate, is the user going to know what to do? Because if you have to explain your interface, your interface sucks. Um, you cannot sit down with all of your users and explain what this thing does. Uh, so if it's not self-explanatory, it's going to fail. And we all have to do first-time user experiences, or little intercepts when you log in, here's our new features. They should really be super optional. Um, nobody loves those things. Uh, sometimes they're cute, but you shouldn't need them. Then, it becomes about stripping things out. So is it simple and elegant? And there's pretty much never a time when you can't strip something out to make it easier. And that often makes life easier both from, makes it harder on the design side, easier on the engineering side, and much easier for the user. Um, and probably also helps you get to uh, point number two even quicker. And then finally, even if you say yes, that it's simple and elegant, you should go back and ask yourself again, because you can probably take more out. So these are the five key questions that I live by. So that all probably sounds well and good, and like I saw some people taking pictures, but how do you actually put this into practice? So this is my practical handbook for how to make design change happen. And this, um, I've done it other ways where um, I've, I've tried sort of things on the opposite end of the spectrum, and it went really, really wrong. So it's my playbook. You don't have to follow it. Uh, as part of, as a new sort of company member of Northwestern Mutual, we are, as a six-year-old startup walking into a 106-year-old company that is very set in its ways. So I think this is a good kind of case study for how we could get some stuff done. So the first thing that I always do is pick something really low stakes. I've tried it the opposite direction. I've gone for like the biggest thing that can have the biggest impact, and people get really freaked out when their primary revenue stream is at risk because some designers come in and want to change everything. So if you pick something where there's no money and there's maybe no people and you turn it into something that really can impact the business and impact the KPIs for the company, then people like really get excited and think you're pretty awesome. Uh, so stay away from the big stuff for, for uh, the purposes of changing your organization. Second thing is to research well. So you know, find out what your audience wants, find out what they need, you know, take the time to do concept testing, uh, look at the, your analytics, and then measure everything important. And the reason why you want to do that is because uh, it can make you look like a hero. So if you measure everything before and um, you know, you're finding, oh my gosh, I did a tree jack study and nobody can find the content they want 81% of the time, and then you change it and you're like, okay, now people can find content 92% of the time, then all of a sudden you're this superhero. So if you measure everything before and after, you have a real benchmark for how to show what you did. Um, when you have those results, share them generously, and then you rinse and repeat. Okay, so how did I do this with Northwestern Mutual? All right, so to talk about day one, when I got there, we had this interesting structure where we had one product person and one full stack designer uh, for, let's say, spending trends for customer for the web. We had a second product person and a second designer for spending trends for uh, mobile for the customer. We had a third product owner and a third designer for spending trends for the web for the financial planner et cetera, et cetera, and nobody was talking to each other, and everything felt completely disconnected. Um, so one of the first things that I did was actually change, A, to have capability-specific people, and then if somebody's working on a feature, you work on it across device and across uh, touch points, so across viewers and across devices. So this is what I inherited. This is my low-stakes stomping ground. So this is a customer dashboard, uh, or a former customer dashboard for Northwestern Mutual from when I started. And... Um, it was kind of interesting because I asked people, like, well, what's the most important thing on this page? Like, what does the company want? So obviously you need to be able to – sorry, this is coming out horrible, but we'll zoom in in a second. Um, everybody wants to be able to know their account info. Okay, that makes sense. And then you see this huge thing about asset allocation and different um, holdings, but mm, not very many of our customers actually have investments with us. So what would actually happen is that this would be a big white block. This didn't scale up this crazy, ginormous footer didn't scale up. It's just a big white block. And over here, these are the things that the company actually wants you to do, but they don't really look very clickable and they don't really look very important. And there's goals in icons, which is the worst 
color in the web. Okay, so here you get a little bit closer. The whole thing's off center. I don't know why that happened. I wasn't here, but um, that was another thing that kind of graded on me. The other thing is that like, I, I feel like I'm of average intelligence, and um, I couldn't figure out like, what's the difference between financial assets, financial tools. I'm not really sure where to go to get like, more details about any of my policies. So, um, what we decided to do. So, my team, we use data-driven decision making within a user-centered context to deliver impactful experiences for employees, our field, which is our financial reps, and clients. All right, so the data points that I always like to use, I like to get the perfect triangle. So analytics are really important because those are the things that people actually do. Um, I like to use qualitative studies to find out why they do those things that we know that they do in the analytics. And then quantitative studies to figure out like where to go next. Um, so ideally, I always like to have all three in any project. So what we did was we did uh, an information architecture research project, so that's for the new navigation. We talked to 1,800 of our customers and uh, came up with a new plan, which made me feel really good because there was a very strong consensus. Um, and then we looked at the analytics. To be user-centered, um, we did a design workshop and we did that with some customers, business people, technology, product, getting everybody sort of involved in the process so they could feel invested in the result later. And ultimately, we ended up doing four rounds of concept and then usability testing on the new design. So where did we end up? Oh, sorry, more impactful experiences. Right, so what does that mean? Um, so let's talk about how we actually made an impact. So this is actually a, uh, a new customer um, summary page that just launched at the very end of May. So to look through this a little bit closer, one, we've really simplified the navigation, you guys can see. So summary, that's pretty clear. It's just telling you everything in short form, what you need to know, sorry. Um, and then this is where you get your accounts info, and then specifically you can find your Northwestern Mutual insurance and investments over here. Pretty simple. But there's also things that the company wants you to do, because they're associated with other great um, sort of behaviors or business outcomes. So any of those things that we want you to do, sorry, this is a uh, design comp, so of course you need to uh, use all your use cases and squish them into a single comp. But here we get to the actions, and these are the things that we want you to do. Maybe it tells you that you have an upcoming bill due, tells you how much, lets you pay it right from there. Also tells you to link your account so that you can see your total financial picture, and that powers actually some these two modules right here. So uh, you connect all your accounts with us, and then all of a sudden you get to see a picture of your total net worth. Uh, it doesn't look right to you. You can add more accounts. It'll let you know if something's not working right. The other thing that we do is begin to give people some insights about where their money is going. And the reason why we do that is that we want people to have a sense of what's changing from month to month. How can they um, sort of begin to see patterns in their own spending behavior that they can then talk about with their financial reps? Uh, moving down, you also uh, can see all of your investment accounts, and then we go into the actual Northwestern Mutual products. And finally, you get to see your handsome financial representative there, John Smith, not real name. Um, and, uh, and then you can also pay your bill. So what happened? So first what we did was we did a sort of friends and family launch. What did we see? We saw even our overall numbers of client adoption went up 29% in two months. We had a bounce rate reduction of 18%. This is the overall bounce rate because at the time we couldn't separate our, our analytics for the people that got the new experience versus the people that got the old experience, but we'll get to that. Um, we saw account aggregation spike, and that's like getting all your financial information together so that you can see that net worth and the spending insights and some other cool features on other pages. And the weekly unique visitors were up 11%. And that might not seem like very much, but when you think about life insurance and how often it changes, which is next to never, it's actually kind of a big deal. So that was very good for us. But we decided that we didn't want to stop there. So then we wanted to continue the momentum from that and change a whole bunch of other pages. So what here you're seeing is the ability to add an account has gone from this little um, overlay with all this text uh, to something a little bit more simple. It's also got um, sort of auto entry and you can easily find um, like the value of your home, for example, with a plugin. We have the old sort of budgeting and accounts view versus the new. Um, and then, you know, your individual accounts, you can like bucket transactions into categories. You can search them. You can see all of them in one place if you can't remember what card you, you know, bought such and such on. Um, and then we looked at the numbers again. So this is uh, continuing with the friends and family, but, um, but with these additional pages. So we saw another 27% uh, bump in our client adoption. Account aggregation went up another 174%. 
the bounce rate went down 44% on top of the previous reduction, and the weekly unique visitors went up another 10%. So that was the friends and family launch. We've just launched um, this to everybody. Is anybody a Northwestern Mutual customer? Woo! Are you an FR? Are you a financial rep? Oh, you got the tie. Okay. Um, so the really cool thing about that is in one week, now that we've launched this, the unique visitors have gone up 500%. This is the only stat that I have because it's only been a week. We only have a week of data. Um, and I felt like nothing else is statistically significant. But boom, really exciting. All the executives are paying attention. And suddenly, we have a lot more trust in design. So my overall strategy uh, is to start small, be data obsessed, and create a movement by creating movement in whatever's important to you. Questions? Sure, so um, Beth asked about the design workshop, what we did. Um, so the way that, that we always start is like, we like to start off with a chunk of like everything we know. So all the research that had previously been done about um, a particular experience as kind of prep work that we share that together. And then what we did was um, we we actually crafted a draft like mission statement of um, a sort of a value for this area. And it's really important that that is from the user's perspective, not the business's perspective, so that you know what's gonna be impactful for users. And then, um, and then we did a series of sketching exercises for both overall page layout and what modules we wanted to have and what should go with them, um, what should go in them. And then um, we kept that like very, very high level. That night the designers went home, worked until like 4 a.m making wireframes and, and light visual design. And then the next day we had the business, the product, and the tech people critique it and then develop next steps. So that was our, that was our roadmap for actually many of our workshops. Always starts with research readouts and then goes into exercises. What was the, the small thing that you started on before doing this major redesign? In the this was a small thing. Oh. We didn't have a lot of traffic. No money came through here because you couldn't pay your bill on it. That was my small thing. Uh, with their financial picture, yes. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see design helping to solve some of those problems, and if possible, how Northwestern Mutual is trying to help at least clients that are in that situation. Yeah, so people have an enormous amount of anxiety in talking about their finances. It's one of the big failings of our country. Like, you're not going to learn about personal finance at home in most cases, and you're not going to be taught it at school unless you happen to decide to become a CFP or something, a certified financial planner. Um, so the problem is, is that I think a lot of the ways that we represent financial information is just incredibly intimidating. Like a spreadsheet makes a lot of people sort of go cross-eyed and not want to look at things, and they don't make a lot of sense, and you don't know if that's good or bad. There's no benchmarking. Um, and we've done a really bad job overall of making um, – of sort of communicating with people, the peace of mind that actually taking care of your finances brings to you. So a lot of people don't know how to start. When they see, um, when they see their financial picture, like uh, there are other account aggregation sites, right? And you look and you go, um, you know, or I did maybe 15 years ago when I got out of grad school and um, saw like my student loans and that big negative net worth number that I had and just went, okay, I'm screwed. I can never do anything. Great. Um, and you have, and it feels so overwhelming that you don't know how to sort of like take that first baby step. So I think what design can do is one, help people who are very fluent in personal finance uh, distill down their messages so that they don't feel so scary and they don't feel judgmental, right? So like the red and the green of the like red, you're okay. I'm sorry, Green, you're okay, and red, you know, you're a bad person, you have no money. Um, first of all, just like taking away the colors, those colors, uh, helps it not feel so judgmental. Um, I think the other thing is, is, I bucket this under design, we also have copywriting under my team, um, is to use plain language. So um, now forthcoming, we're not going to be talking about disability events, right? You're four times, if you're a young person, you're four times more likely to be disabled in your working life than you are to have early deaths, right? horrible thing to have to talk about. Um, 
But instead of talking about disability events and your human life value being at risk, we'll say, you know, if you get sick or hurt, you're going to want to have replacement income so that you don't have to compromise your lifestyle. Oh my gosh, then all of a sudden you understand why you need disability insurance. Um, so we're doing a lot. We're working on, you know, new ways and testing with consumers. Like what are the ways that feel the most comfortable to people to understand different financial concepts? So like another um, uh, sort of feeder study into some of the data visualizations that we have in this experience is that we took nine financial concepts that we know our financial reps have to communicate with people um, you know, all the time about. And then we did a, a full day workshop and looked at all the different ways we could represent that information, chose three directions for each financial concept, and then um, brought it to 2,000 people in the American public to see um, what the perceptions of these different ways to show data were and what was, uh, you know, sort of most visually appealing, but also most likely to spur them into action and then use that to inform what we do. So, um, in terms of what design can do and Northwestern Mutual in particular, I think the biggest thing that they're doing is that they believe that every person deserves a financial plan. And so when you meet with your um, Northwestern Mutual financial representative, um, you will be able to get a, uh, a full comprehensive financial plan. And then we're working, and this is sort of like in the future down the road, but we're working very, very hard to work with consumers and see what makes sense to them so that it stops being intimidating and starts to feel empowering to actually get that financial picture. I think it's really neat that LearnVest has taken this user-centered approach to make uh, these uh, seemingly complicated financial concepts uh, simple. It kind of reminds me of like TurboTax and taxes are like betterment and investment. Yeah. Uh, but it seems like there are still some financial companies that are, are stuck in the old ways of being very complicated with their forms. Uh, do you think that's because they just haven't caught up with design thinking yet, or is it more out of like an intention to make finance this mysterious thing that you need planners for? Okay, so just to clarify your position, we still believe it's good to have a professional on your side, because I think... Um, I think most people would agree, you know, there's no easy mechanism for most people in America to learn about personal finance. Um, so we believe you need a professional on your side. That being said, um, you know, it's, yeah, it's one of those industries that's just like ripe for disruption. I don't think that any company is intentionally saying like, we don't want to really educate our customers because we don't want them to go away. Um, I don't think that's just like the economic environment. <laughs> Um, that being said, I think Northwestern Mutual is amazing that they've decided, you know, one, you've you picked up on something, yes, design thinking is very important to the organization. Um, two, that they want their customers to understand their financial lives so that they feel empowered um, and, and to have all of the financial representatives be partners with their customers. Um, but I think it's just one of those industries that got left behind with all kinds of disruption. That in healthcare. I think they're about the two worst. Sorry, right, somebody in healthcare. <laughs> Can you come back with a couple slides? Can you move back? I'm sorry, you want me to when go back? When you have this big number, when you get more, oh, this one. How is this related with your design? I think the users have to first hit your page and then they see design. Can you explain yeah, we, this? We did, so we did send out an email telling them that a new design was coming. We thought it was cool that you know, five times the normal traffic decided that they really wanted to see it. We included a screenshot. A lot of our emails don't get read, so we thought that was pretty awesome. <laughs> uh, All right, yeah, we, maybe we should do it every week. Yeah, we're going to do it with, with uh, larger releases of functionality, um, so it was very thoughtful. But, yeah, so we're, it's, it's a little bit of the effectiveness of the, um, uh, of the email to people, which we don't send a ton of email, so it's, it's good that they... They read it, but I feel encouraged knowing that overall, I think, you know, that our, uh, you know, account aggregation with, a, you know, 97% before is like getting close to 300% up since we started this experiment. Um, the bounce rate in total is, um, and I do have numbers from the, um, the latest launch, is down 80% since we launched. Um, so I feel good that uh, it's probably a good indicator that things are working pretty well.
Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on selecting the right small piece to take off, like one that is not overly dependent on other parts of the product, but also is like, you know, not too far removed from the metric that actually is important to the business. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that it needs to be, like, it's probably, it's not that it shouldn't be connected to the metrics that, that impact things overall, it's just maybe not yet. Like, you want to pick something that you think you can make an impact on, um, and just that isn't. Um, when, uh, you know, we chose the dashboard because it was something that potentially if we could get people into the website, a lot of people would see. Um, it seems like a good place to like bring a lot of stuff together in a world that at the time was very um, distributed in terms of how many systems uh, customers had at, at their um, disposal to learn different things about their, their account info. Um, so it's really just kind of like being strategic. It's a little bit also so you can fly kind of under the radar until you're ready to reveal. Um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't make informed decisions, but just that uh, you're not going to have a lot of pressure on you immediately uh, so that when you do something that's impactful, then it's, it's a total add-on. It's like gravy. It's not something that people were counting on. Um, so it can be anything, I think, that isn't, uh, you know, the core of whatever company's experience. product before it was launched? Yeah, we did it via prototyping. So part of those four rounds of um, concept and usability testing, those are all with customers. Uh, so we did it when we were just like trying to figure out this direction or this direction. And then um, there were iterative sort of chunks that we had questions on. And, um, you know, we're very lucky. We have uh, three full-time researchers on my team. Um, and we have customer panels, we have um, financial rep panels, and we have gen pop panels. So depending on what we want to know, we're able to engage with them very easily. But always have to talk to the actual customers because if you just talk to like the subject matter experts, you'll find that they're unfortunately often not right. You, you mentioned one of the first things you did was shift the design team from like a platform alignment to more of a feature alignment. Um, can you talk about any problems you ran into making that change? Yeah, I mean, uh, so the product teams were used to having a dedicated designer uh, so that whenever they needed something, they could just go to their designer and their designer would execute. Um, I think it was definitely an adjustment to know that there was a fixed number of design um, assets. And this is part of the, also a function of the fact that we needed to scale to um, accommodate our responsibility for the entire LearnVest business, but also for the Northwestern Mutual digital customer experience. So there were never going to be, they were never going to give me enough heads where every single product person could have their own design team. There's just too many product people now, and different projects have different needs for how many, you know, what percentage of somebody's time they need. So it was, very, it was hard initially for people to get used to, one, the designers not being dedicated to them, so to have to ask for resources and go through an exercise or we were saying, well, why do you want to do that? What do you think the potential impact is? And go through a prioritization exercise. I think the other thing is that when the designers are semi-consultants because they're moving between uh, different experiences, they start to ask a lot more questions and different questions of like, why do you want to do that? How do you know that that's going to be impactful? What percentage of people do that? Um, and, uh, and so all of a sudden, you know, my research team, which is fantastic, is completely uh, sort of like packed the gills of what they need to do because everybody realizes how important it is to um, validate whatever it is that they want to do with data. Um, I'm wondering uh, what if the movement is proved to be not so good or there's no big improvement, uh, how can you change the plan? Yeah, so I try to protect against something actually launching into the wild and being a failure by doing all that testing during the process. <laughs> um, so that's why I like to marry quantitative and qualitative testing because, you know, if you get 10 people and five of them are, you know, real kooks and aren't representative, you may not know it if you only do a small subset of qualitative. If you do it quantitatively as well and you're talking to 1,000, 2,000 of your customers, the trends are going to emerge. That being said, if something launches and it bombs, um, you know, I think you've got to look at the analytics and look at where it's failing, and that can give you a hint of why it's failing, but oftentimes if you can find the where, then maybe you do some more qualitative to figure out the why, um, and then just keep iterating and try and iterate quick. 
I have a question about the aggregating of the financial um, history of a, a person. Is that across all of their different? Uh, how would how do you do that? Because that would be a very new type of. Uh, way of, of, of giving a person their financial picture. Is that, you mean you register all their credit cards and you see all of their assets or only the assets that they have with your bank? No, no. So they have the ability to connect any of their bank accounts, investment accounts. You can um, load in your properties and you'll see if you don't know your property value, it gives you an estimate of what your property value is based on the actual, you know, your actual address. Um, it's not actually new to Northwestern Mutual. It's just been a lot easier to find. Um, they've had it for a while, uh, but uh, but now it's now it's sort of front and center. <laughs> Let's do. We actually are doing things with the data to give you feedback. So like you couldn't see your net worth before, or you couldn't see um, you know your spending trends because uh, well not a lot of people are aggregating accounts, but also because it was kind of hidden in many pages deep. We'll do two more. Okay. Hi. Um, thank you so much for this. This has been incredibly insightful. Thanks. Um, I was so I was wondering. It sounds like just to clarify. Um, obviously, the LearnVets platform is very much up and running and serving customers. Obviously, you have the um, uh, you know the platform that you just walked us through. What has has there been any cross learnings between? you know, both entities and like what has been like kind of the most interesting both from learn from the LearnVest side and also from the Northwestern? Hmm. What's been the most interesting? I think the most interesting insights are always the attitudinal ones, right? Um, so when we talk to customers about why they liked having a financial plan, why they wanted to use digital tools to help them, I was surprised at how many people wanted an external factor to keep them accountable. Um, so that they knew that they had challenges, sort of like if you have a gym buddy and you know somebody's waiting to work out with you, see, it makes sense after. I didn't know this beforehand. But if you have a gym buddy, you know, you're going to show up to that spin class because they're there waiting for you and then you feel bad if you stand them up. Um, people sort of feel that way about their financial planner. Um, so I think that was, that was very interesting to me. And then we are constantly using learnings from, our, from both platforms to inform the other. So like on the LearnVest side, there was a lot of iteration for how to make it easy for people to link their accounts and get that financial information into the platform. And we use that to springboard, the, like that made the design of the new account section that I showed so much easier. Because we, we still, I would say, I mean, we projected it forward from where the LearnVest platform was at. Um, both from a technology standpoint and from a design standpoint, but we had so many learnings from what people had been doing on LearnVest. It just, it made it like quicker, easier, more fun for people. One more, right, right here. Um, a friend of mine who's in the apartment rental business was talking about his website and said, you know, he had to make it so that people could do something on the website, and that was critical for his design. Is that something that you thought about here? About letting people to, do like, something? Do something, yeah, as opposed to just look, touch, have, like an action. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that the number one thing that people want to do probably, what, well, people want to make sure that the value of their accounts, their actual like Northwestern Mutual life insurance or investment accounts um, are right, but they, have to, they mostly want to pay their bills. Um, the, the other functionality of linking your accounts, um, fixing errors, being able to get feedback on your spending, um, those are sort of building up to later stages where we're going to have some additional features that build on top of that. Um, so it's going to get more and more actionable over time. Um, but like, you know, all good product development, you sort of take baby steps and we release, um, you know, we generally have like a big release once a quarter and then a, a maybe smaller release. Uh, at the half point in every quarter. Thank you. Let's give Abigail a round of applause. And thank you, Spotify. Great.